Good afternoon. So some people graciously uh, texted me to make sure the camera is on, probably because they know normally it's off. So I apologize if I scare you with this beard, but we are enjoying a day around the word of God. And one would always look to the Lord, what is a word in season? What is a subject that is uh, the right time? As we heard from three brothers, and Brother Elias graciously have said how difficult it is to speak after two brothers. And perhaps it is more difficult to speak about three wonderful brothers. I felt before the Lord to read about something from the book of Jeremiah and then connected with the New Testament to somehow understand the mind of God in these difficult times we are living and what God desires to do in your life and mine even in the present time we're living in. So I would like you to turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18. I will read just a few verses, and uh, I'll turn to New Testament verses as well. But Jeremiah, chapter 18, it says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause ye to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. As seemed good to the potter to make it. I would like to go to the New Testament and read something from the book of Galatians. Chapter 4 and verse 19, and then one more verse from 2 Timothy. Galatians 4 and verse 19, My little children of whom I travel in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. And the last scripture is from 2 Timothy, from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared for every, for every good work. I think we have heard about certain brothers regarding certain characters from the scripture, David the beloved, Gideon the mighty, Habakkuk, the one who rejoiced in the Lord, the one who would desire to see that the barn are full, there is a fruit for God. And here we come to a man by the name of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was another young man, living in times where, um, if you read it, really certainly you will weep. His message was always in relationship to the failures and how they provoke God to anger. But the reality of it all is that Jeremiah was a young man. And when God called him into service, he has given excuses as good as it is to be humble before God, understanding our nothingness. And yet the Lord in his sovereign grace, he said, say no more that I am a child. God wants to use the young individual, the young brother and young sister it is not to give only the excuses. It's not like to think highly of ourselves. God forbid. We always need to be humble before God. But God will give the energy and the help to bring forth the mind of God toward the people and what they're going through. This is why he was a young man. But he was a young man that mourned. A young man that weep, that wept. A young man that was so much taken up with the condition of the people of God. I don't want to talk about the world. I think we know what's in the world. But he was a person that was so much occupied with the condition of the people of God that he was known to be 
one who lamented. In fact, he has this other small book. So all the chapters, the major writing of this major prophet is 57, 52 in this book and five from the book of Lamentation where he is weeping. And the challenge that I want to challenge myself first and all of us young and old is really when I, when I can sit back and see the condition of the people of God. See how we are becoming so casual with the things of God. And really look and hear the voice of God that he allowed us to go through a time where we cannot be together. We cannot remember the Lord. We cannot show forth his death collectively. And you would say to yourself, what are we doing in this time? Do we feel and do we have the feelings of Christ where you would look at Jerusalem and, and weep? Do we have the feelings of Nehemiah when he heard about the walls and that which protects the people of God and guards them and doors are wide open for every enemy to walk in? Do we weep and mourn and fast and pray? Are we like the Apostle Paul who can say to the saints of God, I have written unto you with tears. And you would think of another young man by the name of Timothy where Paul would tell him, I am mindful of your tears. I wonder how many of us in these last three months, four months, felt the need to cry before the Lord. God, have mercy on us. We have sinned. We have done something wrong. It is so easy for us to blame the world, but the world has to be judged. It will be judged. It will be judged. I think the brethren made it very clear. The previous message was the world will be judged and Christ will be supreme. But I wonder in the present moment we are in, how many of us, are questioning and confessing our own failures that God has given us much liberty and God has given us many privileges to be together but you know what in one sense that we have took it for granted and as it were God said listen I want you now to stay in your own domestic circumstances but not only to stay like this he wants to challenge our hearts is how is he gonna form me how is he going to mold me into the image that he has in plan? So when you come to the book of Jeremiah, you would see that he was a brother alone. He was asked to go to the potter's house by himself. And many of us we have heard is probably self-quarantine in our own households with our own families. But I want to tell you this, as far as scripture is concerned, every time there were individuals, that were quarantined alone with God, they were a tool and a mean of blessing. You think of any man of God and any woman of God. You think of Moses upon the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. He has received the word of God that love God with all thine heart, but also love your neighbor as yourself. Where did he receive it? He didn't receive it when he was with everyone, with, the, with Aaron and with the people. He received these revelations when he was alone with God. When you follow the scripture and you would see that somebody like John, the beloved in the island of Patmos, and when he did, did he become in the spirit, it was when he was alone. And when the apostle Paul, we have heard earlier, was speaking about a prayer and was speaking about all these exhortations and rejoicing. But when did he get so, so much um, assurances from the God, you know, from the beginning of his journey, he was by himself in a street that is named the straight. And he was told, uh, the Lord told Ananias, behold, he is praying. He was by himself, if you want to call it self-quarantine, but it wasn't a matter of pity. And it wasn't a matter of the insecurity. It wasn't a matter of oh, what's going on. And I can't believe it. I can't work. They took these times when they were alone with God. And this is the secret of our spiritual lives, that we have to spend time in secret with God. We miss the meetings. We miss the saints of God. We miss the collective aspect. But yet God in his own goodness and in his own grace, he also exhorted us to do things on our individual time with him alone. And that's why the Lord Jesus, even when he taught us in the gospel of Matthew chapter 6, he says, and when you shall pray, don't make it a scene for everybody to see. Don't show off. Don't make everything to be glorified by man. But go into your own closet by yourself. And this is how God will teach us and will mold us and will shape us to be like his well-beloved son.
And that's why Jeremiah was exhorted to go down and you would say to yourself, well, if I want to go to the potter's house, I should go up because the potter's house is none other but God. But you know what? The potter's house, the beauty of it is God's plan to shape me down here on earth. So it's going downward as we live on earth. God has a desire to shape me, to make me a vessel, as we read, a vessel of honor. But I want to bring certain thoughts that perhaps because the, the, the vessel was marred a little bit and then close with these positive exhortations that I trust that the Spirit of God in our private time for the last three months and even for now, and we don't know when everything will be open because everything is unknown in this world and everything is uncertain. The only certainty is found in God. So when he goes down, he says, you go down and you will hear my words. And I want to suggest to all of you, what's the potter's house is all about? When you go to someone's house, you will have a sense of the kind of person is. You will understand when you look at the wall and when you look at certain things, you will understand what this person loves. When you go to someone's house and you enter into their private chambers, you will understand what kind of books this person likes to read. I would like to suggest to you there is something about the potter's house that you and I, we need to understand and take hold of it in the special times we are living in. So if you took, for example, God's house, what does the God's house reveal of God himself, his nature, his essence? God is holy. So what is suitable in the house of God? It says, holiness becometh thy house. That's the house of God. So if I want to think of the Father's house in John 14, that the Lord touched on it a little bit, you would think to yourself, it's going to be a scene, eternal scene, that through the endless ages of eternity, the heart of love, the heart of God's love and the Father's love will be unfolded unto us through the endless ages of eternity. We would see every feature of love, the courts of love, everything that will speak of the love of the Father and the love of the Son. But when you come to the potter's house, it speaks about God's purposes, especially in relationship to me, how to live and how to behave in this scene here. So what happened with this? The first thing I would like you to, to show, to, to discuss, is that he went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrote a work on the wheels. You know what? Um, I don't know how to make pottery, but I am not, I'm aware and sure that many of you are so gifted to be able to do such a work. I know many of you, I know of sisters, especially godly sisters that know how to work the pottery and the clay and the wheel. But a wheel, if it is not in the hand of the potter, it is one that goes only in circle and have no benefit whatsoever. It has to be in the hand of the potters. And how wonderful, I just want to suggest as we will see something that is negative and dwell of something that is positive, I want you to, be under, to understand that regardless of where is the, the vessel, regardless if the vessel was marked or regardless if God shaped it in a different way, what seems good to him, in both cases, they were in the hand of the potter. And my dear young brother, my dear sister, despite the circumstances, despite the fear and the anxiety, and despite all what we hear in the media, regardless of what men may say, just be in the assurance of this, that the everlasting arms are from the underneath. God is holding us with his hand. God is doing a work, but his hands are there. And no wonder at the end of the life of the Lord Jesus, we also read in the Gospel of Luke that he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Listen, we are in the hands of the potter. It is the hands of the blessed God, and he knows what he's doing. And the end result, even when we go through this difficulty, even when we are facing these circumstances, the end result, it will be for our blessings. For all things work together for good. For we know it's a matter of knowledge. So then the scripture says, and the vessel that's made of clay, was marred. The word could be also translated corrupted. And we're talking about Israel. So I just don't want to talk about the world. I want to talk about it in relationship to individuals. 
So I'm going to take an application in relationship to you and me. Why did the vessel was marred? It doesn't say that the potter marred the vessel, God forbid. Because when God does a work, that him that, is, that began a good work will also complete it. He knows how to do things in a perfect way. But it is you and me with our self will, we have marred the vessel. How did we mar the vessel? How did we defile ourselves knowing that we are in the hand of God, knowing that we belong to Christ, knowing that I am a child of God, and I know that in certainty there's coming a day I'm going to heaven. Listen, this vessel is still in the potter's hand. There's a difference between a believer and unbeliever, and I'm not sure of how many people are watching in the present moment, and I don't know your hearts. Only God knows the heart and the reins. But if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, I would like to remind you of a verse in Psalm, uh, Psalm 2 and verse 9, that he shall dash them, that he shall break them in pieces like a potter's vessel. God will break the vessels like a potter's vessels. He will break them in pieces because they refuse the Son. And that's why the second Psalm ends up, kiss the Son, lest he be angry. I would like to encourage you, my dear friend, if you are without the Lord Jesus, maybe it's one of our children, one you were born in the meeting, as it were. This is the common saying we're familiar with. But you still are without Christ. You will not be a vessel in the hand of the potter to adjust you, to mold you, to form you in the image of his son. But there will be coming a day where he will dash you into pieces because you rejected the son of his love. So may it be that even this afternoon, you will come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So what marred, what marred that vessel? I would like to go through it quickly. And you raise the question, you challenge yourself. Is it true of me? Is it true of me? And I'm going to challenge myself. Is it true of me that when everything was so wonderful, when we had this liberty and freedom to meet together to proclaim Christ, would these features in chapter 17 that I want to highlight quickly, are they speaking of me? Forget the people of God, forget Israel, but just bring it to your own self. Apply it to your own self as I will do also. So what marked the vessel? I want you to go with me to this little journey in chapter 17. In verse 1, the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. The sin of Judah. I'm going to raise these questions as we go through these thoughts. How is your life before and now? Was there something that in your life that wasn't suitable, that was sinful? Did you hear the soft voice of God confess, forsake, repent, and start afresh with me? And then the description that God gives is very serious. With a pen of iron. That expression, the pen of iron, is when the heart is hardened. We have heard the word of God today. We have heard it all our life in the meeting. Is it penetrating me? Is it penetrating me when God speaks? Is it going through my heart? Or is my heart so hardened in a way? Yes, the unbeliever is hardened unto eternal punishment. May God have mercy. But sometimes we act the same way where the word of God is not penetrating my soul. Nothing is affecting me. I live the way I would love to live. And that saying could be applied with me that it requires a pen of iron. God in his own goodness would like to soften our hearts. Is it possible? Yes, indeed it is possible. He wants our hearts to be able to be receptive to the word of God, to the seed which is the word of God. But unfortunately, sometimes we are like these people that their hearts have been hardened and the word of God is not penetrating so that we can live for God and so that we can honor God. And that's why God might allow these times we're going through, not only for the sake of the world, for many to come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus, but for you and I 
to wake up from our sleep and to live faithfully for God. And then he says, as you will move into this, that uh, at the end of verse 1, it is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altars whilst their children remember their trees on the high places. The second thing that God is dealing with that marred the vessel is idolatry. They had something that replaced God. They had something that would worship, they will bow to. I'm not talking about your idols that you make, like in the case of the people of God of old. But the scripture in the New Testament tells me, flee from idolatry. He's talking to Christians. He's not talking to unbelievers. The Apostle John says, keep yourself from idols. So what could be an idol in my life? I don't know what it is. But the scripture defines idolatry as anything that takes the place of God. So what was taking the place of God in your life before? Did you deal with it as God has been speaking to you softly and kindly, even in such a difficult time and the difficult circumstances? Are we willing to remove these idols, set them aside so that God could have the preeminence in my life? The Lord Jesus could be the only one, the lover of my soul. But you know what? If there are many idols in my life, he's not going to have his rightful place. It's impossible. It's impossible. It will never happen. He has to have the preeminence. And the only way is you can deal with the idols that is in your life. Is it the movies? Is it the TV? Is it the sports? Is it food? Whatever it might be. Is it like having a great house? Is it expanding all your things? You want to have the best car? I don't know what's your idol. I don't know what's taking the place of God in your life. But it is definitely a time to be awakened from sleep. It is definitely a time to repent. It is definitely a time to acquaint ourselves with Jehovah. It is definitely, it is time for us to start humbly before God speaks. Search me, O God. David said in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And if there is any wickedness, if there is something of wicked nature in me, of things that I'm doing that are not according to the mind of God and the sinful, deal with me, O oh God. Remove it. Let me repent. Cry to him, and you can rest assured that anytime we confess, he is faithful and just. That's what the Bible said in the, epistle, the first epistle of John. So what happened? So now we have sin. We have a hard heart. The word of God is not penetrating. We have idols that are taking the place of God in my life. And as you move, I want you to take hold of verse 5. Thus said the Lord, cursed be the man that trusteth in men. If there is something I could gain as a believer, with the, especially with the circumstances we're going in, it's I have to stop putting confidence in man. It doesn't matter who it is, believer or unbeliever. We have heard from Brother Elias, nobody knows anything. Nobody has a solution. Nobody has direction. Nobody has a cure. No one can give absolute safety and security and rest. It's impossible. The only one can do it is the blessed God. But the problem with us as saints of God is we start having confidence in men. And when you have confidence in men, you have set aside your confidence in God. That's what the brother spoke about faith, is having confidence in God, regardless of the circumstances. And it says in chapter 17, cursed, God abhors and hates every time when his people look to a man rather than looking for God. You know, when the people of God wanted a king and they chose, they wanted someone like Saul, he told Samuel, listen, calm down. It's not that they have rejected you. They have rejected me. Why? They wanted to put their confidence in a king like the nations. Where's my confidence? Is my confidence in the leaders and them in non-authority that we need to pray for them? We need for... Pray for their salvation. We need to pray for wisdom. We need to pray for direction. I can never take away from that because the scripture says so. But is my confidence in man or is my confidence in God? And the people of God then 
the individuals, you and I, perhaps I have my confidence in a person. Well, you have to adjust that. And you have to set every confidence on the side that is in man, that is in yourself, and set it upon God. You know, it says in the English language, because I don't want to talk about the Hebrew and the original, but in the English language, it is said that Psalm 118 verse 8 is the middle verse of the Bible where it says it is better to put your trust in Jehovah than to trust in man. What happened? Why this vessel was marked? Look what verse 5, the end of it. And whose heart departeth from the Lord. Why weren't you in the meetings? And now you wish you are there. Why couldn't you make it to midweek meeting? Why couldn't you make it to Lord's Day? Why couldn't you commit for the Lord's Supper? Is there something deep in my own soul that has departed from the Lord? Is there something in me of Demas that have forsaken what Paul spoke about and what the Spirit of God spoke about through different individual is there a sense of departure deep in my own soul that's what marred the vessel we wanted to depart we want to be independent nobody can tell me what to do i am my own man we have accepted the formula of the world i have done it my way and we are losing sight of God's way. They have departed from, from Jehovah. Look at verse 12. I'm going to finish with the negative. When you go to verse, me, when you go to verse 11, and it says, He shall getteth riches and not by right. I wonder if one of the most things that is occupying the saints is financial security. If I'm good financially, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. But the scripture says here in verse 11 that the vessel was marred because they want to get riches and not by right. Who gives the right of riches? Who gives us the money? Who gives us our jobs? Who gives us the mean to live? Who provides Jehovah Jireh? Who provides? David have it right. He says all from the everything we receive. We receive it by right. I trust it's by right. From God himself and from thy hands do we give. Is it making so much money? Is it possession? Is it because you want to have a bigger house than your brother, a bigger car, a nicer car than your sister, whatever it might be, that you are consuming your time into working and working and working and working to gain some riches, thinking that money will make you everything right and everything sweet? Trust me, it will never do. But when you set your affections after riches and after money, when your treasure is not in heaven, when your heart is set upon treasures that the world will offer, the vessel has been marred. Look at uh, verse 18. I'm sorry, verse 15. Behold, they say unto me, where is the word of God? I think the brothers touch enough on the word of God. Where is the word of God? I don't know how to express it and be kind about it. We have a tremendous ministry, tremendous word of God above all. It starts with the word of God. We have tremendous help to understand it. 
brothers to explain it to us. And then we will ask the question, where's the word of God? There was nothing for me. There's nothing for me. They said to him, where, where, where's the word of God? With everything that he spoke to them, they still ask, where's the word of God? Have you been satisfied with the word of God or you want something else with it? You know, unfortunately, young men, young ladies, and sometimes older ones, they leave the meeting. And they go elsewhere. I'm not going to talk anything about elsewhere. But to their own thing is, there's nothing for me. When I should sit quietly before God and ask him to allow his word to do his work with me. The last thing that the vessel was marred, he says to them in verse 21, 23, you have belittled my day. He speaks to them about the Sabbath. That was their day. But I want to bring it to the Lord's day. Why did God allow it? I have no idea, but I can speak of what you feel is your own experience. Perhaps I belittled the Lord's day. Maybe football became more important than breaking bread. Maybe sports, whatever mean it might be in every country, replaced the Lord Jesus. Maybe boxing, maybe whatever it might be takes the flavor of remembering him so quickly on the Lord's day. Why the vessel was marred? Because we have belittled his day. And I wonder why did the Lord allow us to be in our homes? Not to be in the meeting, not to have this conference in the meeting, not to remember the Lord in a meeting collectively. I wonder. I wonder, I don't know exactly the mind of God, but I know he speaks to me. I wonder if it is because I did not have the right assessment and the great appreciation of the Lord's day. He said, you don't have the appreciation for it. Stay home. Stay home. Stay home. So with this, I don't want to prolong the story. But I just want to finish on a high note. And the high note I would like to close with, although there's so much could be said. But that blessed potter, he said, I'm going to shape you. And I'm going to mold you. And I'm going to form you in a way that you'll speak of my son. No wonder Paul in Galatians chapter 4, he was talking, I travel. I'm willing to go through the pain of it. I'm willing to do whatsoever it takes. I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to take it on the chin. Whatever you might think, young people, young and old alike, whatever it might take. There are some individuals that have so much love for you guys that whatever it takes, they are willing to take it upon themselves so that Christ might be formed in you. So that when people outside, from without and from within, can look into you, they can see Christ Jesus. That's what the potter is doing. That's when the, he's forming the vessel. What is he doing with the formation? What is the Spirit of God doing in your life? Just say so he likes to indwell. Wow. Well, that's God's sovereignty. We thank him for it. God's love. But the Spirit of God is indwelling you, indwelling me, so that he can form Christ. So that we can be in his hand and molding us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the Apostles Paul mission was. Not only that you are saved, this is only the mean. Please let it sink in your own soul. This was only the mean that God saved you from hell. 
but he has something greater that you and I can never fathom it, that he wants me to be like his son. And that's why it's so important when I'm in whatever the word calls it, the quarantine, just allow me to say it. Don't waste this time when you have plenty of it. Don't waste this time on useless stuff, on meaningless stuff. Just spend more time in the presence of God and let the potter's hand shape you and form you and mold you to be like his son. So that when they look at you, they call them Christians first in Antioch. There was every feature of Christ that was found in them, that people could see it, people could feel it. They took notice that they've been with Jesus, the Lord Jesus. How did they take notice the way they spoke, the way they behaved? How did they become like this? Because the potter's hand. He made them a vessel what seems good to him. It doesn't say it was of clay. It doesn't say again it was of clay. It was this, he, what seemeth good in his eye. You know what? The grace of God did for you and for me. They took us from the dust. We are from dust and to dust we shall return. This is where Adam was created. But if we bear the image of the earthly, he made us vessels to bear the image of the heavenly, to bear the image of Christ. May it be that God has spoken to each and every one of us today that we would allow the word of God to impress our souls that we might be as we read the last verse that God could train me in these times when I'm by myself with him so that if the Lord in his mercy I don't know he knows if the Lord kept us here and there was a way he found a way for us to go back to normal if you could say that that you and I, allowing the potter to mold me and to form me into the image of Christ, that we can be vessels of honor, to honor God. And we could be vessels fit for the master's use. I trust that God will make his word precious to your soul and mine. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our God, we are thankful to thee for the Lord Jesus. We're thankful for all what love has done. And we pray that thou will impress us with the thoughts, gracious God, that thy purpose for us, even here, yes, we know through eternity, he is bringing many sons unto glory to bear his image. But thy purpose here for us in this scene is to also form Christ in our lives help us in these matters we pray thank thee for this day make thy precious but thy word precious to every soul adjust us we pray as we commit ourselves to thee in the name of the lord jesus amen 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 just amen amen amen, amen. just to say in closing brethren we just want to thank you so much for being with us today it's not easy that it's done this way, but we're thankful for the mean. There might be things that were said, perhaps uh, they were not understood clearly. Perhaps some of you might have had some questions to be asked, and unfortunately, we didn't have a session like this. I would like to suggest that I'm sure Brother Emil will be kind enough to answer these questions and put it on toward the mark. If you have any questions, don't think of all oh, the opportunity passed and I couldn't ask. Send any questions to, um, to Emil. Also, please, when you talk to your saints locally, please send our love and greetings to all the saints and express to them how much we miss being with you and the conferences and whatever things that have been canceled but god knows what he's doing i don't know if there is any other announcement i'm sure uncle Emil might say something about the zoom and to leave it for everybody may god bless us all and bless you take care I